Um, I, I know Mark didn't mention this uh, during the announcements, but if you haven't, if you're not aware of, um, today is March 14th, which means that it is Pi Day. Um, so if you don't know what Pi Day is, it's, it's March 14th because of 3.14 is the number for Pi. And just so you know, my favorite pie is blueberry. Um, and I think Mark said his was pecan. Uh, so um, do what you want with that information. Uh, no, we're, we're really glad that you're here this morning um, as, as we continue to study the book of John. Mark's been kind of dedicating this year to that study, and, and here we are a few months in, and we're going to be in John chapter 4 today. You know, I think, I think um, as, I, as I think through this title, he calls it Genuine Jesus, and, and I think through that, I think, man, how, how sincere and authentic Jesus is in the things that he does and who he is. And then I reflect on my own life, and I realize how I just fail to measure up to that over and over again. Because if I'm really being honest, and honest, and if we're all really honest, there's moments in our lives where we're not sincere, where we're fakes, where we, we wear masks, and we, we hide our real feelings and our real hurts. We hide who we really are from one another. And I think too often we try, to, we try to do that. We try to hide our faults and our failures. We let our insecurities and our uncertainties kind of get in the way of, of making decisions and, and doing ministry. And, but I think that if we kind of take a step back, as we, as we do this study, as we look at the life of Jesus, we kind of take a step back and we try to glean from some of the principles from his life. Rather than, than trying to, to say, well, I don't measure up to Jesus, if we just kind of glean some of the principles, alter our lives, adjust our lives a little bit, we can become more genuine, more sincere, and more authentic like Jesus. And I can, can't tell you how many times I've sat with, with students when I was a, a youth minister, whether it be in my office or um, at a conference, and talking with students as they've tried to make major life decisions that were going to alter the, and a, the rest and affect the rest of their lives. Uh, you know, it'd be things like, you know, where do I go to school and what do I study? I even had one student recently um, when I was in my time in Greenville uh, that said, Matt, what should I do? And it's like, I can't answer that for you. No one can. Only you can answer that for yourselves. And what I often do in those moments is I begin to ask questions. I try to get them thinking through different things and, and, and leading them in that way the best I can. I wonder, though, what, what process do you go through? When you're, when you're faced with these major life decisions, when you're, when you're faced with things and what should I do or what shouldn't I do, how do you come to those conclusions? And I'm hoping that as we look at the life of Jesus today, we can kind of learn some principles for how we can go about doing that. And so if you're new with us this morning, we're glad that you're here. Um, and, and like I said, we're in John chapter 4. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles, if you haven't done so already, we're just going to be in the first four verses there. But I want to kind of recap where we are in the life of Jesus up to this point. Okay, so Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. Uh, after that, Jesus went and spent 40 days in the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan in a time of preparation for his earthly ministry. After that time of preparation, Jesus went into Jerusalem, and that's where he cleansed the temple for the first time. And, and as Mark mentioned, he said he was, he was the first church cleaner. And don't forget, we still need church cleaners. So if you haven't signed up for that and you want to help us out with that, feel free to do that. But after that time, Jesus began to call his disciples, and they began to, to follow after him. And he, he kind of was going all over this region of Judea, uh, teaching and preaching. Um, and it's during that time that Nicodemus came to Jesus in the, in the night. And we talked about that for the last couple of weeks. Um, and, and John has actually moved out of the region of Judea and into Galilee. And that's where we pick up here in this. Uh, in this. And so if you want to, John chapter 4, verse 1 through 4 says, So then, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, Although Jesus himself was not baptizing, rather his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again to Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. You know, as I was preparing for this sermon, I realized that these verses are transitional verses. They move us from one part of the story and one aspect of Jesus' life into a completely different area. And the question that I ask when I, when I read this is, why did Jesus have to leave Judea? Why did he leave Judea? You see, Jesus is, as you can see on this map, Jesus is in that area of, of Judea. He's doing ministry there. 
and, and, the, and John tells us that he leaves Judea to go to Galilee. So he's, he's traveling there, and, and there's that area of Samaria. He's actually setting us up for, for a great conversation he's about to have with the Samaritan woman. But when you look at this, you say, why does Jesus leave? Well, he leaves because of the Pharisees, number one. We, we see that. It says, verse 1, So then, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was, was growing in his ministry. And, and this was going to set up some confrontation between him and the Pharisees. And we know through, from Mark, um, Mark, 12, or Mark 11 and, and Matthew 12 both, that eventually that confrontation is going to lead uh, to, to the Pharisees looking to get rid of Jesus. It's going to lead ultimately to Jesus' death. And it's not time for Jesus to die. There's so much work that needs to be done yet over the next few years um, in his life that, that it wasn't time for him to be crucified. It wasn't time for that. And so as a result of that, he leaves with, with the Pharisees. And they begin to plot, plot his, his death in that. Another reason that we see and, and is, is that John is arrested. And so when, when we're studying the Bible, especially the life of Jesus, it's important to look at all the, the, the books of, uh, of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in order to get a fuller picture. There's some scholars out there that have taken um, an, uh, an approach and they, they put all those Gospels together and they make it what's called a harmony of the Gospel. And so I happen to have one of those. I use it whenever I'm studying the Gospels. Um, I highly recommend picking one up. All it is is a scripture put together. And so as, as we read through this, we see a clearer picture, a better understanding of what's going on at the same time if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke along with John. And so in Matthew 4.12, it says, Now when he, Jesus, heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. Mark 1.14 says, And after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee. And so we see that there's a confrontation with the Pharisees, but also John's taken into Galilee. Well, why is John or John is arrested? Why is John arrested? Well, we read Luke. If we read Luke chapter three, it says, "But when Herod the Tetrarch was reproved by him on account of Herodias, his brother's wife, and on account of all the wicked things which Herod had done, he added this also to them all that he locked up John in prison." Okay, so I just want to kind of take a time out. Who is Herod? here, right? Herod the Tetrarch. This is not the same Herod uh, that is Herod the Great, the Herod that was ruling during the time when Jesus was born. This is a different Herod. This is actually his son. See, Herod is a dynasty name. It's not necessarily a first name. And so Herod the Tetrarch is actually Herod Antipas, okay? Uh, Tetrarch just simply means that he's ruling and kind of governing a specific area. And so Herod Antipas is ruling, and, and John is preaching against Herod. Well, what happened? Well, after Herod the Great died in 4 BC, his area of ministry, his, his, his country was broken up into three regions by Rome. Uh, the first is, is that of Judea. Uh, that's where um, one of his sons ruled. Another is this area called the Decapolis, where his son Philip rules. And then Herod Antipas rules Galilee and Perea as well at the same time. And what happened was that Herod the Great, he was he was kind of a crazy person. He was very harsh, and, and, and um, he actually ended up killing some of his own children and some of his wives that he had because they plotted against him or he thought they were plotting against him. And as a result of that, as a result of that, one of his sons, Philip, Herod Philip, not the Philip that rules in Decapolis, it's really confusing, but Herod Philip, Herod II, um, gets passed over for, for being able to rule. He was married to this woman named Herodias who was his niece. And what happened was Herod Antipas divorces his wife. He, he, he leaves his wife, and Herod, Herodias divorces her husband, Herod II, and they get married. And John says, this isn't right. right? Think about it, okay? It, it, Herod Antipas divorces his wife and marries his sister-in-law, who happens to be his niece. And John's like, God calls us to a better standard in our marriages than that. He, he, he calls us to a better standard in our marriages than that. And, and he said, this isn't right. And so he's preaching against this. And, and evidently, it got to the point where Herod um, was kind of sick of it. And so he arrests John, which eventually leads to John's death. 
And so Jesus is arrested at this time, and, and some scholars would have said that, that Jesus went to Galilee uh, because there's this spiritual void in leadership there. It, that the, the area of Galilee was ripe for, for a harvest, that there was so much fruitful work that could be done there that, that it was needed because John was no longer there and Jesus knew that, so he went to Galilee. I don't know if that's true or not, but it makes sense to me. Some people also said that when, when John was arrested, his disciples probably scattered. Kind of like how Jesus, when he was arrested, you know, um, Peter, what did he do? He decided he was going fishing. And so some people are saying that some of his disciples were leaving and they needed a shepherd to come in and bring them back. And we actually see Jesus calling some of John's former disciples as well. And so we see this, this picture that, that Jesus is leaving because of this confrontation, but he's also leaving because John is arrested to go and do more ministry. And Jesus fit, moves to fill this void. He transitions his ministry from Judea into Galilee, where he's going to spend at least the next year of ministry before coming back for the fa uh, Passover meal. And I, as I was working on this sermon, I was really struggling with how to build this sermon and, and take these four verses and, and turn it into you know, life application for us. And, and over the past couple of weeks, I've known I was preaching on this. I've been studying it. I've been praying about it. I've been talking with some people about it. And it wasn't until Tuesday. I happened to come into the, into the church here to grab my guitar. I needed to get something out of there. And I was headed over to the office, and I, and I was having a conversation with somebody who was just kind of walking around uh, the sanctuary here. And there was one thing they said in that conversation that really stuck out to me that, that I just couldn't leave uh, behind. And so as, uh, it was a small part of the conversation. And as I was leaving, uh, they said something along the lines of they were ready to give up an area of ministry. I don't know if they're serious or not about that. Um, I hope they're not because they do a great job. But it got me thinking about when do we know when it's time to give up an area of ministry? When do we know when it's time to pass that mantle on? That's not the first conversation since I've been back that I've had with people. In fact, somebody recently called and told me, you know, I think they may have been, might have been joking. They said, you know, I'm getting too old to do this anymore. Another person one time, they've been doing this one area of ministry for, for probably longer than I've been alive here in this church. And they're, they're ready to, to pass that mantle on. You know, one thing I do when I recruit volunteers, or at least I used to do when I was a youth minister, I would ask people to commit for a certain amount of time, whether it be three years or four years, to stay and be consistent in a kid's life during that time. But I never wanted it to be like a life sentence where I got you as a volunteer, you're always a volunteer, and you can't get out of this no matter what until you're, you're in the grave, right? We don't want that because sometimes there's times where we need to give up areas of ministry even when it's fruitful. See, Jesus' ministry here was growing, right? He, he was getting really popular. The Pharisees were beginning to notice him. Nicodemus came to him and said, hey, you're a great teacher. We know this. We know you're from God. It's good things are happening, and yet Jesus leaves that area of ministry for another area of ministry. And sometimes, sometimes in our lives, we have to leave one area of ministry for a different one. The question is, how do you know when it's that time? How do you know when to do that. How do you know when you should stay or you should leave? Uh, I'm glad you asked because in Luke 4, as we continue on in Luke 4, it tells us that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. See, Jesus was led by the Spirit into Galilee. Yes, there was confrontation of brewing with the Pharisees. Yes, John was arrested, but Jesus was so in tune to the Spirit and God's call in his life that it moved him into Galilee. It transitioned him into that. And we see this, this other transition happening during this life of Jesus. This transition from Jerusalem and the temple being the focal point of worship into a person being the focal point of worship. It's no longer about where you worship, it's only about who you worship. And we see that in this, in this conversation that we're getting ready to have, uh, with, that Jesus is getting ready to have with the Samaritan woman. He's transitioning from Nicodemus this Jewish religious leader to an outcast. And, and he's beginning to, to, to move towards this Gentile inclusion that, was no, that wasn't present at the time. As, as Peter reflects on this in Acts 10.35, Peter references his move, Jesus' move from Judea into Galilee when he says this, but he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. See, it, it no longer matters where you worship. 
it matters who you worship. Jesus accepts you if you fear him and does what is right. You respect him and does what is right. And so I just kind of want to walk with you through a kind of a process of how you determine what you should be doing and what God is calling you to do. Because God is calling each of us to do something. He calls each of us a minister of reconciliation. We all have a job. We all have a role to, to play in God's kingdom. And so the question is, what, what role do you have to play and how do we determine that? In your bulletin, there's an insert. And on one side, there's some core values. On the other side, there's some questions. And we're going to kind of walk through those questions this morning. And I'm going to give you some time to kind of reflect a little bit as well. Um, but I also know that, that as we walk through these things, you may not have a solid answer for every single question today. And that's okay. My hope and my goal for you is that you go home and you pray about this, and you reflect on this, and you work through this as you determine what it is that God is calling you to do here at Burnside. And so as we look at this, our, the, the first thing that we're going to do as we try to determine our mission, try to determine our purpose in life, and, and try to determine what God calls us to do is to look at our burdens. And what I mean by burdens is this. When you look at the world around you, what are some things that you wish were different? When you look at the world around you, what are some things that you wish were different? What are some things that break your heart when you look at things? What are things that, that brings tears to your eyes? What makes you say, I wish somebody would do something about that? If you had a lot of money, how would you use it to benefit and help other people? What things are just wrong, unjust, or unfair in this world that ought to be made right when you look at them. What new stories? What new stories have you heard recently that make you really upset because someone is hurting or is in need? And on the flip side, what new stories have you heard that make you smile and fill you with joy when you hear of them and you think that you could do something or you long to do something like that to help? If you could wave a magic wand if you could wave a magic wand, how would you make this world a better place? What would you do? What experiences in your life has God comforted you that you could use to comfort other people? And so uh, I want you to take a few minutes and just kind of summarize, and maybe if you can, some of those, some of those things, uh, you know, what may, may be your top burden? What are some of those things in that? And based on this, based on this, who do you think that you can serve in our community? By saying something like, I think my top three opportunities or my top three service opportunities might be this. What are two or three things that burden, that break your heart during this time? See, I believe that Jesus had a heart for the lost and the hurting. I, I think it's very true. I think if you read the scriptures, you can't get away from that. And we see that by, by this story of him moving from Judea into Galilee. He has a heart for the lost. He has a heart for the hurting. And, and we see that because, you know, when the woman who's bleeding touches him, he stops. When he's walking into a village and there's a, a funeral procession that's coming along, he stops. When the Samaritan woman, who's an outcast, needs to be seen and heard, he does those things. See, Jesus has compassion on people. He has compassion. So what breaks your heart? I believe that the lost and the hurting are what breaks Jesus' heart. In, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. And I believe that that is God's burden. I believe that that is a burden that Jesus has for this world. What about you? The next thing we do is we kind of determine our mission as we look at our values. What things do we have in our life that are important to us? What are important to you? The first question is, who have been the most influential people in your life? And what values did they instill in you? It could be a parent or a grandparent. It could be um, an aunt, an uncle. It could be a youth leader. It could be a teacher. Who... Who has been influential in your life and what values did they instill on you? For me, there was this couple named Randy and Barb Stevenson. 
And they were influential in my life at, at a time where I needed some people in my life. Randy kind of, um, I started to learn guitar and he kind of took me under his wing and helped teach me guitar a little bit, invited me into the praise team. Uh, Barb is the reason I'm in ministry. I can tell you that right now. Uh, because at a time where I was kind of wandering around lost, Barb invited me in to help her teach junior high Sunday school. And she spoke truth into my life at that moment where I needed it greatly. And from them, I learned things like being consistent in a kid's life is really important. I also learned that the, having concern for individuals. Uh, Randy and Barb, Randy was, was a sheriff's deputy. Uh, he, he became um, the sheriff of, of the county in which I, I grew up in eventually. Um, but he, he led a jail ministry and a prison ministry. He, they, would, they would invite people into their homes who just needed somebody in their it, it, as they transitioned in their lives or they were at a low point in their lives. I saw that the way they interacted with myself and my brothers as well and, and other people in the community and learned, learned from them a value of having concern for individuals. Who is it for you and what did you learn from them? The next question is, which scripture verses have impacted you greatly and what are the underlying values behind each of those verses? What are some scripture that you've, as you've read the Bible and as you've, you've walked through and you've heard sermons, what things have stood out to you? What, what scripture have you, have you clung to, have you held on to tightly? For me, one is, is Psalm 116, verse 1. It says, I love the Lord because I heard his appeal for mercy. And, and along with that, uh, Jesus in, in Luke 4 quotes a, a passage in Isaiah that says uh, that, that he came to set the prisoner free. And if that doesn't scream transformational hope, I don't know what does. It, taking a prisoner, someone who is enchained by sin and setting them free is transformative. This, taking somebody who is guilty, who deserves punishment and bestowing mercy upon them, man, there's hope in that. And so for me, that, that's, that's, those are just a couple verses that have stood out for me that I have just been held on to here over the last few years greatly. What is it for you? What verses have stood out to you? The next is, what have you experienced in life that has been significant and has left a deep mark on your life? And what values did you learn from them? You know, these things change over time, right? As you go through different things in life, different things are going to impact your life in different ways. And they're going to create different values in your life. Over the past 10 years, as, as I've been a father and, and, and have um, kind of developed in, in that and matured in that role in my life, and as I've developed um, as, a, as a minister and, and matured in that as well, some of the, the things that I have learned is, is that value that, that Randy and Barb taught me was a concern for an individual. Every person matters, regardless of who they are, regardless of where they're from. And that's something that, that I had to learn. I didn't always believe, but I've had to learn especially over this past 10, 15 years in my life. For Jesus, I think, and you can see on the back side of your paper, there's, there's some core values that are listed there, some just things that, that may stand out to you. For Jesus, I think two of them that stand out to me about him, one is shepherding. We see that in this story where he, he goes to Galilee and he begins to gather disciples to him. Another one is compassion, where he just has compassion on people who need it. What experiences in your life have led you to different values? What are some of those things there? And all of these, our burdens and our values, all of this leads us to actually defining what it is that God is calling us to do, to, to a vision in our lives. So the question is then, what is God, based upon your burdens, based upon the things that you value, what is God asking you to do? What does he want from you? What is, what is the ministry that, that he has for you that is set up? See, because I believe that mission comes from who we are. It comes from who God has made us to be and who he is shaping us to be. What God is calling us to do is based upon who we are. It's not easy necessarily, but it is right because it's who we are. He has gifted each of us in different ways to do different things. And also, we need to understand that our values, the things that we value, shape the things that we do, and it shapes our missions. And so if, you're, if you hold on to shepherding as, as a value, um, maybe being an elder is something that, that you should do. If you hold on to truth as being as something that you value, maybe being a Sunday school teacher is something that you should do. 
If you hold on to um, concern for an individual, maybe helping with a youth ministry is something that you can do. What is it that God is asking you to do based upon the burdens that you have and the values that you have in your life? Because your burdens plus your values equals your vision. Your burdens plus your values is what equals your mission in life. It equals what God is asking you to do. And in a few minutes here, the, the praise team is going to come back up and we're going to sing that song, Be Thou My Vision. Um, and, and in that song, I, just, I love that song and I love that Becky chose that song because it's, it's in, the words are saying, Jesus is the center of my life. Hey, we're placing Jesus at the center and that's what really matters. Because if Jesus isn't at the center, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter what burdens we have. It doesn't matter what we value. It doesn't matter our mission. If Jesus isn't the center, then it doesn't matter. Jesus is the, is the pillar and he's the cornerstone and he's the thing that we build everything off of. And maybe today you don't have that same drive that, that Jesus did, that, that purpose that he has in his life. Maybe today you don't have that relationship with him. See, Ephesians 2.10 tells us that God has made us to do something. He has created us with a purpose. And maybe you haven't discovered your purpose because you haven't discovered who Jesus is. And we, can, we, can, we would love to meet with you and we can talk with you about that. And during the song, there's going to, um, you know, Mark and I are down front already, where you can meet somebody at the cross, one of the elders out there as well, and, and begin to have that conversation about what does it look like to actually follow Jesus if you've never made that decision before. And maybe you've been here and, and you've been kind of coming here, but you've never committed to this body saying, you know what, I want to be a part of this body. As you're doing things in the community, as, as you're on mission, as you have a vision for the things that you want to do, we would love to meet with you at some point and talk to you about what it means to be a member of Burnside Christian Church. And maybe today, maybe today you've been here and you've been following after your own heart, doing the things that you want to do and not doing what God has asked you to do. And maybe it's time to recommit and say, you know what, God, I want to place you back at the center of my life. I want, I want to build my life around you. I want to be on focus. I want to be on mission like you are on mission, led by your spirit. Today you can recommit to joining in his purpose and in your, of your life. And my prayer for you is that as you begin to place Jesus as number one in your life, regardless of where you are at today, that he is your vision, that the burdens he has placed on your life and the values that he has instilled in your life is leading you to the ministry that he has called you to do. Will you pray with me? Father God, I just thank you so much for, for who you are. I thank you that, um, that you do have a heart for the, those who are hurting and those who are lost. Because God, I, I know that at times in, in my life I've been there and I've, and I've needed you to have that heart. And so I just praise you and thank you for that. God, I thank you that you came full of compassion and uh, to shepherd us, to, to help us to grow. And I pray that, that if there's anybody here who does not have a relationship with you, God, that they can, that they can make that right. That they can receive the forgiveness that you offer and the purpose that you give. And Father, I pray that if anybody here just it needs to recommit their life back to you and to your purpose, I pray that they, that they do so during this time. That as they reflect on these words and as they sing these words, they can think about what it is that you're calling us to do and who you're calling us to be. Father, I thank you so much for all that you do in our lives. And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen.